are you? Hello, everyone. Thank you, Damien. Um, welcome to Careers in Travel. My name is Annalisa Sorensen, and I am a travel journalist and writer. Um, and how many of you out there are travel writers? <laughs> a lot of you. So I often, often will target sort of change the way that I talk about travel writing depending on how or what the background is people have. But I have been a travel journalist for the last 15 years. Um, I'm a journalist, I'm a writer, I'm an editor, I also do photography and production and radio and TV. Um, and I cover essentially the entire world, but my focus initially was on guidebooks. So I co-authored guidebooks to Belize and Spain and Canada and around. And now I write for magazines, newspapers, and online, and I also do radio and television. I often go on to the local newscasts to talk about top destinations and why. And one of the things that I often talk about in terms of careers in travel is that many of you can kick off a travel writing career much faster than you think. Um, I think that we're living in a world where now more than any other time, travel writing is accessible to all. Of course, because of blogs, but also because there's many, many, many other ways that people can sort of share their travels and their journeys. Whether it's via social media, whether it is beginning to contribute to guidebooks, and on and on. People are very, very open to take on new travelers, new travel writers. I taught a class at Media Bistro called Introduction to Travel Writing for eight years. It was one of our most popular classes. For good reason, as I always say, people want to escape the cubicle, and that's how they were able to do it. And now I do one-on-one -on -one coaching, also on travel writing, and essentially my whole angle is how to keep off your travel writing career, basically in three steps. And all of you who travel who have that background can do it. So welcome, and I hope to share some wisdom on travel writing, and how you can kick it off here in today's panel. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Kimberly Ramsawak, and I'm the founder of ProfessionalJetSetter.com, which is a blog where I help professional and ambitious women who have a passion for travel uh, figure out their travel new jobs through working in the travel industry so they get paid for travel. Um, so essentially, I am a traditional career coach for the travel industry solely. Um, my, my experience, I've had 15 years in corporate tours and service marketing, um, which recently I've been a um, where I promoted me as a destination for retailer around the world. Um, I have had uh, taught at various universities here in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York. Um, so really teaching careers and travel because I think a lot of uh, the misconceptions is that working in the travel industry is that you work home for an airline, a travel agency, a hotel, or you travel right. Um, but there's so many more career paths within this wonderful industry. Myself, destination for the marketing was the economy of the high tech and great careers industry. So I like to teach women, um, and I'll tell you why women are in it, it's so women. But I like to show women that this industry is very broad and very vast. And yes, you can get paid to travel without having to take a career break or quit your job to travel or just escape the human cubicle. I've had a 15 year career in the industry where I've traveled all around the world, getting paid by a corporation to leave London. So it, it does exist. Um, and the reason why I talk about women is because um, we, unlike men, feel that we have to be 100% ready to do anything in fact um, I can't find that job. My resume is not ready. I don't have experience. Who's going to talk to me? I can talk to the CEO of that hotel because, no, I don't have anything. I don't know what to do. Um, but I challenge you to really think that you already have your interests, your skills, your strengths, and knowledge you already have it in you. The, the kick is to articulate that to travel companies and show how you end up. But I can challenge you to talk to anyone in this room and take your experience and figure out a way to translate that to the travel industry you can get paid to have a corporate job and you can travel So thank you for being here and I look forward to your questions. Time 
and it gave uh, bloggers, even beginning bloggers, access to some of these destinations that you wouldn't be able to get access to otherwise. Um, we don't act as an agency, and this would probably make some people angry, but we're really based on results. So just because you have a blog with 10 million fake followers doesn't mean that it's worth anything. We actually put our tracking pixel in every single story to make sure that people, real humans, see the story, read the story, and consume the story. Uh, the path here wasn't as clear cut um, for me as for uh, our other panelists. Um, I started out on Wall Street and took a couple of detours through Hollywood, uh, PR, unemployment, uh, failed startups, a couple other things, and somehow, some way, kept banging my head against the wall. And here I am today. I still try to figure out how I got here. So maybe we can go to the drink now. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction to each of you. This is probably an opportunity to share a little bit more on, on what we've already touched on, but I wrote down, in a run-on sentence, what prepared you for a career in travel? So what are the little things that really got you where you are in your particular specialty? Um, great question, Damien. I always like to say the question is not why I became a travel writer. The question is how could I not become a travel writer? I actually uh, grew up around the world. I was born in Germany, and at the age of two weeks, I flew to Cairo, where my brother was born. My parents gave an Arabic name, Dalek. Uh, and then we lived in Southeast Asia and North Africa until I was 15. My father worked in tropical medicine, then he entered malaria. Uh, and I moved then finally to the U.S. at the age of 15. I never been to the United States before that. Um, I went to international schools where English was the language we spoke. Um, so for me, travel was in my blood. And my mother is Catalana from Barcelona. My father is born and raised in Denmark. Uh, so the background is pretty incredible. Each of us are named in the country we were born in. So I am Anna Lisa, is the pronunciation. I was born in Frankfurt, Germany. Um, and my sister Taina was born in, in Puerto Rico. The Taini Indian from the first settlers of Puerto Rico. My brother Tarek from Cairo. And my brother Alexander, the only one that was born in the United States on the 4th of July. Oh, so, <laughs> so my background, uh, that's basically what led me to travel. But one of the things that I often like to talk about and to touch on Damien's point is that I had that background of travel. Um, then I went to UC Berkeley, a country unto itself, as I like to say. Um, but one of the key things that I often will see with travel writers is many of them did not do their first international trip until their 20s. And that started a passion that's more than anything I've ever seen. So I'm a huge, huge believer that it doesn't matter when you travel. You don't need my background of having traveled since birth. Travel your first time in your 20s, 30s, whatever, any single time to create that passion. I think that all of us are here at the travel festival have a shared passion to travel, which to me is an amazing, amazing thing. I almost can't talk to someone when they say, oh, I don't really like to travel. I just I cannot bring myself to continue the conversation. So that's what I'm a big believer in, um, which is you can introduce travel into your life at any point, become passionate about it, and then decide to follow through, as, as our wonderful panelists are saying here, from multiple angles, multiple angles, whether you do journalism like myself, or following their path, which are pretty amazing. So that's to me uh, how travel came into my life. I'm going to pick back on what I said. Um, I am first generation born from the to Trinidad and So travel was in my blood. I took my first trip to Trinidad when I was six years old by myself to visit my grandparents. So travel was always something we did every summer. Um, and then I got really got the love when I started studying abroad in college. Um, I studied abroad to Spain, Italy, um, France, literally. I had many semesters I could travel, study abroad, I did it. Um, and then after that, I was just figuring out when I graduated, you know, my first job out of college was working at Express with a brand new intimate bachelor's degree, um, holding clothes. And I said, you know, it has to be a way for me to find a job where I get to travel. And through a lot of trial and error, <laughs> 
Um, but you know, it sort of it just fell on my lap, and you know, I'm a firm believer in asking what you want, not being guilty for what you want, and putting it out in the universe, and the universe will bring it to you, not in the way that you have you know imagined it to, but it will come to you when it's supposed to come to you. And um, my corporate job that entailed traveling sort of really fell into my lap. Um, I originally from Philly. Um, there was NYU was having a course in literally it was the time of careers in traveling to work. So, and I took the bus up from Philly, go to NYU to attend the course. And after I took the course, I, um, you know, befriended, which was, you know, back then it was called, you know, befriended, but now it's called networking. Um, but I uh, you know, spoke to the spoke to the, the teacher that took the course, and I said, "Can I take out the coffee?" She said, "Sure." And that coffee led into a two-year um, long-distance friendship, mentor, mentee relationship. And then at the end of the day, she said, you know, I'm moving to Nebraska. Um, I would love for you to take over teaching my class, but I believe you could do so. And I said, I uh, can't do that. I don't know anything about the in that industry. And she's, she's like, you did. You learned everything from me over our relationship. And you, you know, just one thing that your passion for travel will help, help you through. And I took a little faith, and I took a little day in that course, that non credit course at NYU, Careers and Travel. And I did that for three years until people started saying, you know, now working for Macy's in the tourism department. How can I get into that job? How can you help the department? How can I work in the travel industry? And that's what led to one thing, led to one thing, one thing, which led to the um, So it's just, um, if I would give one piece of advice, it's just don't worry about how it will happen. Just go on to the press of it. Your passion for travel is enough. Your desire to want to travel is enough. Um, and you know, the universe will just unfold it for you. As, um, Google has now. Um, but it's true. Um, so um, that's the really okay. So the short answer is nothing prepared for the year. Um, <laughs> I have no degree in travel, no background in travel. Honestly, like I'm one, probably one of those weird people that actually said, like, oh God, I got to go to this place today. But <laughs> it's kind of annoying. And really, how we started was by just doing it. There's probably a lot of people out there that you know that like to say, oh, we're going to have this job, and, but I can't do what I want to do because I have to pay the bills, and you know, there's excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse. And we started this business about four years ago, um, trying to figure out how to make native advertising, sponsored content, more efficient. We, our first customer was a friend's friend's dad over a ranch in Montana. Uh, they called the Ranch of Rock Creek in Phillipsburg, Montana. Um, High-end ranch, and they realized that for, for rich people use the internet. And from there, what, what I've learned is that a lot of brands can't necessarily see further than uh, what, they, what they are. So, real life example, the company that I started before, um, we, were, we were going into pitch major league baseball. And my intern at the time was British. He said, hey, you know, can I just do a cricket uh, video? Because it's kind of the same as base. But I said, sure, it's the same thing. And the guy at that time said, I see how this works for baseball. Or, I'm sorry, I see how this works for cricket. But I just don't see how it works for baseball. And I was like, but it's the same thing. How is it not? So when we got the ranch at Rock Creek, I said, I'm, I, I've learned my lesson. We can't stray too far from this. So then we started working with other hotels, other airlines, then destinations, and that's kind of how it happened. Um, we, we decided to take a focus because I think, like a lot of people, they say, oh, you know, I can take over the world from day one. And, and maybe this is possibly good advice as a travel blogger is to find a niche. If you're everything to everyone, you're really nothing to, to anyone, right? But if you're that one, so there's a lot of other quote unquote influencer networks out there. But we're the only ones that do it for travel, right? And, and we go to all these things like we're here today, we go to the, the one in Philadelphia, the one in San Francisco, and people know us, and, and, and the word gets around in the industry. Um, and that doesn't mean that you have to stop just to travel. If you think about some of the big companies that are out there, Amazon.com, they used to just sell books, if you forget if, if I'm dating myself. <laughs> Facebook used to just be at Harvard. Sam, Yelp used to just be in San Francisco. So it's not really limiting yourself. 
Um, but we chose to, to focus on travel, figure out what, what travel is all about. Um, and, and you all can do the same as well. Roger, hold on to that microphone. Um, what could you have done to be more prepared for a career in travel? Short answer, nothing. Um, part of it is you're paving your own path. Uh, I think a lot of people say that they read the, the, the Bill Gates bio or the Mark Zuckerberg bio. They say, okay, I'm going to step by step do exactly what these folks did. Well, these are single use paths. If you try to build Facebook today, you would fail miserably, right? If you try to build Microsoft today, you would fail miserably. If you try to build some of these same companies that all these bi biographies um, have done, you would fail miserably. And I think the best thing that you can do is just do it. Right? And, and that's very cliche, but I think a lot of times there's, there's high price consultants, um, this and that. And, and the whole point of this is to kind of pass off blame, right? So, if, if, if I hire Damien to say, hey, David, should I do A or B? And it takes three months and $50,000, and finally Damien says, you know, there's an 80% chance that A is right, but there's also a 20% chance that B is right. I'm like, okay, great, thanks for the advice. I could have just done A in a day, figured out that it was wrong, saved $50,000 in three months, and then moved on to B. So I think a lot of times people are afraid because they don't want to take the responsibility of saying, you know what, I did it, and it was wrong. I made a mistake, and I was wrong. No hands in crystal ball. And I think that's the, that's the biggest thing that I've learned is take responsibility. You tried it, you messed up, who cares? You know, it, it's much better to have tried it to fail than have never tried it at all. I want to take a crack at that same question. Characters. 
That's one of those things where I wish from the beginning I had known, and I had treated my trips that way, as opposed to, but why would someone want to read about my trip? And the final thing is, always remember that it's more about the viewer or the reader's journey than yours, ultimately. They're reading your piece, but it's because they're taking it in, and it's how it's affecting their trip and their experience. So those are kind of key things that, as a travel journalist and writer, I would have loved to have known from the beginning, and I feel now I do know, so I'm sharing it with all of you so that you can, you can sort of take advantage of that. You told us that. Um, you touched on a little bit, uh, each of you has touched on this in kind of a different way, but what are some unconventional sources for knowledge about different places around the world? Um, I mean, I teach hospitality tourism, so we teach this in class, and that's one very direct path that people can take. You took that course, you did the drug. What are some great sources that you come across that have just opened your eyes to how a place is, or what it's like, or um, you know, what's the visit, that sort of thing, that you'd like to share with them? Yes. Um, so unusual sources of sort of travel information and you know that kind of thing. Um, well, to me, one of the most important things when I go and when I go on a trip, um, I often feel that the tourism office is very overlooked and sort of discarded and maybe not seen as a good place for information. But the reality is, as a travel writer, they're one of the few places that I can call up and say, "Tell me what is going to be happening in the next two years to this particular city." Um, they can literally tell me, "Oh my God, we have a new museum that's opening up in 2018." Okay, that kind of information is near impossible to find anywhere else. And it's absolutely critical if you're pitching an article because you need to have the music pay. So people often overlook the tourism offices, like, well, I don't really have to go there. Actually, you do. They have this incredible wealth of information. The most critical thing is how you ask your question. So I will often call up and rather than what should I see, because they have a sort of, uh, you know, they have kind of the stock response they give. Rather than that, I say, what is going to be opening in this city in the next 18 months? With that pay, then when I arrive in the city, I go and I look at that, and I learn about that. So that becomes my news and pay when I'm pitching my article. So that's a very cool source. And then the other one, to me, I love to go to, um, you know, sort of very unvisited parts of the city. Not that it's cliche, but for the most authentic experience, whether it's the municipal pool, or library, uh, or what have you. Every city has it, but going and visiting and just spending an hour or two really soaking it in, I feel like there's an authentic angle that you just cannot find elsewhere. So those would be two of my top ones. Excellent, thank you. Uh, my two top ones, if I have a connection with a sister institution, whether it's a friend or a relative, someone I know that lives there, that would be my first point of contact with their locals. Um, but second, absolutely the visitor center. As someone who has worked in the visitor center before, it is the most underutilized asset of any destination. Um, I just wear visitor centers, visitor centers, or tourism offices. Um, this could be Manberg and where it's located. Tourist information center, tourist center, visitor center. Um, it is the most unrealized asset of this nation. How many of you have been to the Times Square Information Center back in the school in Times Square? Times Square, right? Well, people. It was a hidden gem right in our Times Square. Anything you want to know about the future events? that wasn't even out to the public yet, they had information to ask people to write. Um, so that is a really good deal of what I've used. What I've used. I don't know what I've used. Sources. Uh, I guess I'm biased, and I would say you all, bloggers, content creators, writers. Uh, and the interesting part of that is why. Well, if you were to read a story about New York or USA Today, they probably won't tell you to go to Times Square, Statue of Liberty, and Fresh State Building. But if I'm reading the food travel list, because that's what I'm interested in, they'll tell me all the great places to go in New York about food. Because that's the one piece of data that they have about you that you like food. Um, so that's really, I mean, it's overlooked. It, it may or may not be, be obvious, but Google is my best friend. I mean, I don't know how many times. Google is so easy to use and you get it so overlooked. Um, and, and it'll give you the unbiased opinion 
on things. We, we always look at the different stories that are out there, and the tour support always comes back to us and says, how come people aren't clicking on the link that says, you know, if you want to learn more about New York City, click here at nyc.gov. Well, does anybody click on these things anymore? For a couple of reasons, right? Number one, the experience on Facebook, clicking to an outside link is horrendous. If people don't have mobile optimized sites, it's a nightmare, right? It's like you can't even see it. Pretty soon you've conditioned yourself not to click on Facebook. Um, so that, that's one reason. And then secondly is Google's a great clearinghouse. So if I click on that link saying, uh, New York City is a great place to go, well obviously the, the site that it links to is going to say that New York City is a great place to go. But if you go to Google, you can also get that one star review that says, oh, I don't like New York City because it's too crowded. Right? And if that's the worst thing that can happen, then it's not a bad place to go. So, Google. Cool. Great. Glad you're on the time. Uh, so, we're going to switch gears a little bit. What are some unique careers in travel that you've encountered? You have one of them, and that's why I'm starting with you. But I'd love to hear some of the roles that you've seen out in the world that people have in the travel industry, but people aren't necessarily aware of. So we, we created this, this role for ourselves. Um, it didn't exist a lot of five years ago, but the fact that the internet boom and everybody has their, their faces and their phones all the time looking at Facebook and fake news uh, is really <laughs> good for us. And there, there's no other way to explain it. Tourism boards want to get in front of people, and that's where the people are. Um, but what we've seen come from that has been really interesting. There's, there's, a, there's a woman I know, she's probably here, or maybe not, who has a TV show about barefoot dancing around the world. Right? And that's really something that couldn't have happened five years ago. But now, that, you know, there's an audience of people that like to dance barefoot around the world, like this one of these destinations, right? Um, and, and we've seen just about everything under the sun, like people that only travel to, to destinations that have vegan cooking, um, living, sustainable travel, I mean, you name it, there's, about, uh, there's a niche for everything, but the great thing about that is that you're the, you're the master of that domain, and you can create that. Every day there's something new that's coming out, and you can just do it, right? That's the cool thing. You, nobody has to give you permission to do anything. You can just do it. So if there's some niche out there, find it, and eventually, general public will say, hey, you know, I mean, think about all the people that were sustainable living 20 years ago. Everybody thought they were weird, freaky people, whatever it might have been. And yesterday, it was Earth Day. Right now, there's a holiday for all these folks. So, the world has caught up to where they are now. They are the experts and the leaders in their own field. So, pick something. And stick with it. People are going to make fun of you. When we started this, people thought we were stupid. They're going to work. Like, why are you trying to do this? Get a job. But if you stick with it long enough, you're eventually going to get there. Right? If you pick something that nobody else is doing, don't, don't roll with the tie because then you're competing. Right? When you're done competing, you want to have a monopoly. And then this goes into some way other stuff. But if you're the only one there that does this super niche thing, then you're the master of that domain. Versus, hey, if I go to Paris, everybody goes to Paris, right? Thanks, Ryan. Um, two career paths that I was questioning two career paths. You need unique, unique <laughs> careers in China, unique roles in China. Uh, two things, uh, visitor services, so anything in visitor services realm. So for instance, um, working with visitor services department for a museum or a uh, retailer. Um, how many of you know that Bloomingdale's has a visitor services department? In which they employ marketing and sales professionals to market Bloomingdale to the national and of course. Including us. Macy's, of course, which is where I started my tour career. Um, for a retailer has that. So retail tourism is booming. So when you think about it, when you travel, what do you do? You eat and you shop, right? So retail tourism is big luck to this industry, right? And a lot of retailers, outlets, um, what's the name of the outlets outside of here? The Wood, 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 Wood,
department, Simon Wall tells us how to work in the department we're looking for professionals. She doesn't have to come from towards the travel background. If you have that skill set, marketing, sales, PR, web development, um, to promote their establishment, retail establishments to the tours to that state international tourism, that's a great career path. If you go to any outlets, I'm sure you'll see, especially on day like today on weekend, all the buses lined up, right? Of Chinese tourists or domestic tourists coming from, you know, Jersey or California. Someone had to in there, right? So visitor services. In the same vein, destination marketing, the tourism market. Um, how many of you know here in New York City there's something called Biz? Biz is a recruiting district. Um, Times Square Alliance is a big one. Um, they handle the tourism, um, all of the events that happen in the Times Square boundaries. Um, Experience Forum is a fairly new big business recruitment district. Um, fashion district has one, I believe. So working for these bids, which I call the mini destination marketing organization, that um, was on that very particular area, clean, fun, um, attractive to tourists, um, meeting the needs of different residents and businesses there, that's um, another career path that I don't see many people don't really know about. Um, <laughs> but the top two of the visitor yeah, directors, they're also up to you. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm a bid director, so please. There you go. Right? Two minutes are coming home. Yes. So, bid, visitor services, destination marketing are the top three, which are very kind to people who are outside of the industry to give a great skill set, marketing, and sales. They're very well Fabulous, fabulous. Yes, now I'll uh, to the follow up on that and say um, probably one of the biggest things is um, <clears throat> the fact that if you want to be a travel writer, you're in the best city in the world to do it. <laughs> the entire world is obsessed slash hungry for New York City travel news. It is astonishing. You go to Europe and you say to people, where do you want to go to the United States? It's Las Vegas, New York City. Okay, so basically you can all start your travel writing careers literally tomorrow um, by taking your neighborhood or your borough or wherever it is and just start pitching articles about New York City. So I feel like it is so overlooked, but it's probably one of the main ways that you can really launch your travel writing career tomorrow. We're especially lucky to be in a place that the entire world is obsessed with that. And probably will continue to be. Uh, and then the other thing about niche media, the reality is, precisely as the panelists have been saying, um, there was a time when you couldn't do a niche, you couldn't cover something very specific, like vegan, very potent, in the world, or what have you. The reality is that now, that is exactly what people want. Because so many people are traveling, they're also looking for voices that speak to them and to their experiences. So there's no time right now to launch a blog, and especially a blog with a nice, tight angle. Um, you can, of course, do more on that blog if you want to, but you need to market yourself as the voice of that, and that's really, really critical. And the third thing, and this is probably the most important thing I mentioned before, is simply the type of writing that you can do now. As I said before, there was a very sort of traditional type of travel writing. One goes to the market and smells this very sort of almost the wit of elitism to it. I don't know, there was something very, and now, guess what? No, no, now, what Eat, Pray, Love is about breaking up and going and traveling and trying to find yourself, you know? It's, there, there's a huge, uh, again, a hunger for that kind of writing, that kind of honesty. And I always say that honesty is critical to travel writing. People forget that, in fact, an honest experience of I didn't like eating that bug is a thousand times better than the incredible bechamel songs in the Paris restaurant. What's funny is the thing that you were honest about. So don't forget that honesty and they will allow it to come into every aspect of your writing and storytelling. All right, so before we move into Q&A, here's a tough question. It's almost like a game show. All right, so it's 2030, so 13 years from now. What is one career in travel that will no longer exist? And then one, maybe two, that are going to be new and relevant. Okay, so there are careers that are coming up that we may not have thought about that have to do with travel. And there's some that we have currently today that have been hanging on by a string, maybe, maybe not so popular anymore. Uh, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on those two questions. I know this is confusing, I'm sorry. That's okay, go ahead. <laughs> We already have the automated monorail on that Disney World. 
So we probably don't need that trade guy. Um, you know, that guy, unfortunately, is gone. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that's low hanging fruit. What will exist, though, probably, is the ability to travel anywhere without leaving your home. So some kind of virtual reality tour guide will take you to all these places, and you'll never have to leave. What was it? What's the saying? Don't leave home without it. Now you don't never. Have to, yeah, you never have to even leave home. So people be even more kind of, you know, antisocial and introverted more than now looking at their phone. Um, but I, I think there will still be a reason to travel, right? Just like if we think about why our our, our the generation before us travel, it was to see things. Hey, I want to see uh, the Grand Canyon. I want to see. The Now, if you want to see these things, you punch it into your best friend Google, and you can look at every single picture at every single angle. So why is this new generation travel? Well, it's probably to connect with other cultures, to understand some of these other folks that are around the world that have a different way of, of seeing things and a different way of living. So in the future now, when you can now connect with these people without even leaving your home, there's probably going to be a new reason that we want to experience this, right? And, and again, I think VR will get to the point where it's almost like we're in the same room, kind of like Obi-Wan Kenobi shows up right here. So, that's my answer. Um, let's see. Career paths that will be more in demand, more perfect. Um, I like to say, you know, more vacation. So this whole Pokemon thing that was going on last year, whatever, um, whole implication of turning things into some type of interactive experience. Um, things that can travel space, I think, will be more prevalent in the future. Um, number one, number two, anything experiential. Um, even though we kind of still have that now, um, but you know, getting away from sightseeing to more sight doing, sight feeling. So instead of going to practice at the tower, I saw it, okay, I'm going to get back on my bus and go see anything else. You know, I want to go to the top of the tower before it opens, before anyone else has access. I want a, a French chef to cook me dinner on top of the tower. I want to learn French while he's cooking me the food. I want to experience it. And I want to feel it. I want to bragging rights. I think bragging rights will just get more stronger and more stronger as we go into 20, 30, whatever the period is. You want to have like, ah, oh, this. I didn't just see this, I did this, I felt it, you know, I felt, you know, I got almost, you know, the pain of you know, I felt you know, the pleasure, you know, experiential tourism, I think, will be a lot more prevalent in the future. Um, and that is what's the whole virtual reality thing. Um, not even able to leave your home with the sensation of, you know, let's see what it's like to be in war war. Um, at some level, tour guiding, I want to say. Um, especially now you can just put on a headset and walk your own self to the museum and pass on an hour and get to your computer, you know, your viewers. I think at some level, at least with domestic tourism is concerned, that would be less more prevalent. Um, Please, but yeah, yeah, try again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <So> virtual. Uh, <laughs>
Um, I think that you know Esperanto obviously did more work, so it will be a new way of, of communicating, and I think that will be huge. And like I said, if I were an investor, I would probably invest, and I need <laughs> invest in it now. Um, so those are kind of the two the two big ones I think is that you know no more paper guidebooks, and then we're going to be having um, language services. Um, and the, the final thing that I think is always really important is trip curation. I feel that even though we be able to do virtual travel, even though we may not have guides walking us through, it will become ever more important to have a trip curated. And by that I mean someone actually telling you actually this is what you should do with your precious time. Um, it is a glorified travel agent really when you come down to it, but the reality is that I think it is missing. It's something I do a lot of myself, and I see people coming to me all the time for it. Um, so anyway, I think if that is something oddly enough, it seems like an archaic position, but in fact we're going to be going back to that as we go into the future. So you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is the time for questions and answers. And let's start off right here. Hi, my name is Ben Gentleman. Um, my name is Gail Davis. Um, I actually do some work with the UN, and this is the International Year of Tourism. I love all you had to say from Mr. Wilman and all of you. One thing that hit me the right away, maybe it just doesn't sit well with me, is I think at this time and place, we have no room for dragon rights. It's just simply enjoying so that you can share with others. And when you have that experience, then you can share with other people and they get the flow of what's going on. Um, my question is, you guys are so experienced in the areas, okay? Um, there's a friend I have online, and she is like one of the top brand advisors, ambassadors, but she travels around the world, okay? But she will not share her secrets. But she, she travels from like, you know, Jeep Cherokee to Mercedes to like different hotels and things like that. Our group has traveled to Thailand, dealing like the minor hotels and, you know, and really getting what's going on in the culture and the country and dealing with that, and we want to know how we can bring that more to the service, dealing with the real deal of what goes on in that country, and the more, like you said, the more authentic places to go, and culture, like what you should do when you go to that particular country, or what you should do when you go to that particular country. How do you get, you know, that's what we're exploring, and getting the word out more about that, and also couple with the other places to go, really taking people a real tour of the country, whether it's through writing, whether it's through virtual reality, and, and so here's my question. How do you deal with if you want to focus on the luxuries of them and the way that everyday people live? And you want to capture all of that, not just the one area, and get the airlines to pay for it and the hotel. <laughs> Which are 
Yeah, exactly. There are no press trips, there are fan trips. Fan trips comes from the term familiarize yourself. People will often write, yes, that is a whole other world, but it does exist. And you're right, it does mean that you are, the word that's used a lot today is influencer. If you're considered an influencer, right, or you are an influencer, whether you are a writer or whether you are with these wonderful exactly. fabulous are doing in this area, or, you know, it does mean that you are considered someone who has some uh, strength and, and importance within your industry. And then, absolutely, it does mean that comps and cover and free travel does come along. Um, in, from a journalist's perspective, you have to be very careful, actually, because a lot of the big outlets are not open to taking a, an article or someone who necessarily took a sponsored trip, so journalists have to really look at that and balance it out. But an Instagram influencer, um, which is really huge and rising a lot right now in travel coverage, Absolutely, will be invited by a country, by a tourism office, by a hotel, by a, uh, an airline. A lot of the airlines are doing that because they want to be covered. So, one of the ways that you can sort of get into that is you can follow some top influencers on Instagram, on Twitter, on social media, uh, and see kind of who are the brands that they're working with. That gives you a good sense of who's open to it. Um, if you see, for example, like you know, Turkish Air recently, um, Etihad, there's a lot of the big airlines, Singapore, a lot of the big airlines now are working with travel influencers. So if you see a brand showing up a fair bit on an Instagram account or on someone you're traveling, you then know they're open to it, and then it's only a matter of reaching out, explaining why you're an influencer, explaining why you are a good fit for working with them, and then taking it from there. In the interest of time, actually, we're going to leave that question. I think that was a great answer, and I'm sure you guys could follow up. Let's take another question from the audience. Uh, we only have about five more minutes, so I want to make sure that we can answer these questions. Here we go. Yeah, just, uh, I guess I'm wondering, in your own travels, wherever that, whatever continents you've been to, what have been some of the most creative uh, career yeah, the most creative careers you come across in conversation, whether it's someone at the airport or someone, sometimes they carved it out a certain way that's very unexpected to the traditional content creation and other things like, you know, they're an expat in one country or you're traveling every few months. That sort of thing that will enable one to have that nomadic lifestyle while also having one or multiple careers in front of them. Um, for me, um Okay, I went to you before this niche marketing because it was services. Um, I met a girl, I went to a trade show, and I met a girl who um, actually here in New York. Um, she worked for a restaurant management group. So, you know, a parent company that had multiple restaurants. And she frequented those restaurants, she loved to eat there, and she had a marketing skill set completely outside of the travel industry. And she approached the general manager and said, hey, I would love to market, you know, go to trade shows, marketing your restaurant groups. You know, background in PR and marketing sales, and she literally created a job for herself. So that's, I mean, that sticks out of my head. It's one really cool job where she doesn't travel, you know, she doesn't have an office per se, but she has a corporate job. You know, that's not a like full time. Creating, creating a job for herself Absolutely. seems, yeah. it's not spoken of much, and I've been to many different travel related events and conferences. And I'm just very curious, with our own travelers in the room. What sort of wow? Like you met that person. Right. I can't believe someone can make money. Right, right. It's definitely prevalent. I mean, it's not really well known, right? But um, like I said, going back, take an action. What do you like to do? Everyone knows about all location tours, right? No? Mm -hmm. Yes. Everyone knows Sex and the City, right? <laughs> Seinfeld, right? Woman started this all location tours, right? Where she takes tour buses full of women from all the sites that were featured in Sex and the City. Shows. So the restaurants carry in and the apartment in the village where she lived. Um, she created a tour company, a tour operator business out of her passion for this TV show. Um, and she's doing very well to this day. So it's just taking what you like to do, your niche, your interest, your knowledge, your existing skill set. So I want to strut the emphasis on your existing skill set and just be creative. I'm not being able to approach, you know, the people my friends who approach the general manager of the restaurant. Or if you're on your own, whether it's entrepreneurial or working for a corporation. All right. Um, I think since Roger's holding the microphone, we're going to do this part, which is uh, final words of wisdom for the audience from your perspective related to careers and 
Uh, well, I was going to quickly answer the, the other question, which is, this is what we do, right? We connect brands with influencers. And because no brand wants to deal with one influencer with a thousand followers that needs a hundred bucks to get a store, right? That's too much work. They want to, they want to spend a lot. They have a huge budget, right? A huge, I mean, relatively huge, it's like a million dollars. And they want, they don't want to deal with parceling that out to 50 different people. Now, in terms of free travel, I'm going to be very blunt about it. Don't expect it. Because if you think about the value proposition that you offer, right? How much a, a, a free air, air, airplane ticket is, hotel room, meals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Are you offering that much in value to the destination? Much more. Okay, if, if you are, then, then it's worth it. But you really have to think about what that value proposition is because most of the time we have people that have half a million followers and it's just not worth it. The ROI for the destination is not worth it. They might even have five million followers. It's not worth it for the destination to pay for all that travel. Now in terms of last words, well, I say this to like a lot of the folks that, that I talk to about college. Um, every year we give advice to the students. And nobody ever takes my advice, so maybe it's bad. <laughs> Thank you.